So today I went to see a panel discussion at St. Mary's University. Academic freedom for students. How free should the students be? Uh, shout out to Indie Media East Coast, whoever that is, for alerting me to the event. I summoned up the courage to drag my sorry ass out to it. Because it's good to get out of the house. And it's probably more faces than I saw in the last year. But I owe a debt of gratitude to Lindsay Shepard. She shone a spotlight on Nathan, my new nemesis. And I couldn't be happier that she has advanced this particular discussion. So I'm going to try to collect my thoughts on it. And anyone who has been following this and the broader culture war is welcome to join me as I do so. When I got there, there was a guy standing outside the door, handing out sheets of paper to everyone who went in. And I thought, oh nice, a uh, summary of the situation, some context about where everyone is coming from, what they're talking about, so that we can be properly oriented in the middle to know what's going on. And then I got in and found a seat and started reading through it, and realized, no, 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 this is, this is a, a piece from a student newspaper or something like that, that has been printed out to highlight the hysterical, fear-mongering distortions that surround these issues. This is a, 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 a sample of the ridiculousness that occurs around this simple discussion about freedom of speech. It was only two-thirds, three-quarters of the way into the panel that I realized, no, no. Some students printed this out, they wrote it and printed it and gave it to us to be damn sure that everyone walking in would have the right ideas, would know where they should be situated to interpret what's going on. The panel itself didn't make a huge impression on me. There were a couple of young philosophers and a student's association president and Ms. Shepard herself, and they all made good points that I was happy to hear. But none of it was unexpected. And as I was listening to them and taking notes, I was mostly thinking about something that the MC had said in his introduction. Something to the effect that even after a noxious idea has been disproven. It's still around, it's still in the atmosphere, and it can still infect people. Now I love a good metaphor that can illuminate a complicated subject, so I started thinking on that. Well, th let's say that bad ideas, dangerous ideas even, are an infection. Well, there's two ways you could approach that. You could try to eliminate it from your environment, or you could try to improve your immunity. As near as I can tell, as a medical and scientific layman, our obsession with living in a sanitized environment is making us more sick and more allergic to our environment. And it's really hard not to think that there may be a correlate to that phenomenon in the intellectual space. People are becoming ever more sensitive the less they are exposed to ideas that their system rejects. That was my main takeaway, but things got interesting when it got into the question period, particularly when IFO came to the mic. Uh, unfortunately, I reacted too late to get it on camera. But he went on a tirade against colonialism and slavery and the residential school system. He provided a whole litany of the things that the white man has done and said, well, all of that was done in the name of rationality because the theme of the comments that the panelists had made was that rationality will get us through this. And he said, yeah, well, rationality came up with all these ideas, so I'm happy to be irrational. Something to that effect. And 
Lindsay's response was something like, well, I think what you just said was irrational. It was great. I hope the video will come out. Now, to either side of me were a couple women, and maybe it was just the auditorium setting brought me back to my younger days, and I thought out of the corner of my eye that one of the girls was kind of cute. However, I did have to remind myself that I have learned since university that bright colors like she was wearing are how nature alerts you to a toxic or poisonous animal. Anyway, uh, at one point I remember applauding some rationalist point, while meanwhile the women to either side of me were clapping at all the stupid things that were said. And yet nonetheless, my hair was long enough and my eyes were glazed enough that I think I tricked them into thinking I was on their side, that I was an ally, because I was laughing along with them as the questioners began to get more and more emotional. Some of the women's voices were shaky, and the men's voices were shouty, and I thought this was hilarious because it's not that hard, I think, to speak calmly and rationally and logically. But if you really believe in the rhetorical necessity of expressing your passionate emotions about a situation, well, you're darn well going to do that, and some people did. And I thought that was great, but I think my amusement somehow lined up with their amusement, or they were parallel amusements. But what I want to say is that when all the questioning ended, and, and, and we stood up and began to get ready to leave, my ideological opponents to either side of me were chatting in a friendly fashion that gave me the feeling that they thought I was on their side. And they're not wrong in that we were both enjoying ourselves alongside one another for different reasons, in a way that could almost convince us that we were together. In that we were feeling the same thing alongside one another, we were part of the same collective, whether we liked it or not. During the panel, I saw that the person to the other side of me had a bingo dapper, and I thought, that's fucking hilarious that these issues will circle around the same buzzwords to such an extent that it's, it's just bingo marking them off. You know that these will be the touch points. And I thought, yeah, that's really good. These, these are my people. This is really funny. Later, I took a picture of the woman's bingo sheet and saw, no, no, they were marking off the talking points of the rationalists because how dare they repeat ideas that to these people were illegitimate. And yet at the same time, they had a point. Whether someone has arrived at their political positions by a series of logical, rational arguments, and they're willing to have those ideas tested, or they've come to their ideas by emotional rhetoric, and they're not willing to have those ideas tested. Either way, people are sure of what they think they know. And so the argument the panelists were making was, let's talk it out, shall we? But if you've come this far, I expect you know that's tragically unlikely. Let me read you the slip I was handed as I walked in. Being retweeted alongside far-right neo-Nazi podcaster and Unite the Right organizer Mike Cernovich might give your average Twitter user pause for concern. Massive popularity among self-proclaimed Kekistani trolls might lead a person to ask, am I saying something wrong? One might think twice before lauding Faith Goldie, an overt white supremacist 
fired from the rebel media. Not Lindsay Shepard. Shepard, a TA at Wilfrid Laurier University, gained significant popularity on the right after surreptitiously recording a meeting with her supervisor in which she was reprimanded for showing a irrelevant to the course video of Jordan Peterson, attacking the use of they as a singular pronoun. Peterson, whose acolytes have a disturbing pattern of directing sexual harassment and death threats toward his critics, has become a far-right luminary, not for his academic work, which is largely uninspired, but his unabashed defense of natural hierarchy, misogyny and racism with pseudoscientific gloss, and unapologetic transphobia. While Shepard initially tried to pass herself off as, quote, a liberal who, quote, doesn't share Peterson's views, this pretense has largely been abandoned as her star has risen among unabashed fascists, the alt-light of Proud Boys and Trumpite bigots. She's been particularly keen on expressing her opposition to, quote, cultural Marxism, a not-so-subtle repackaging of the cultural Bolshevism conspiracy theory advanced, literally, by Adolf Hitler and friends. Among her other, quote, causes are opposition to, quote, postmodernism, land acknowledgments, quote, trans activists, and the other expected dog whistles to reactionary politics. This is all par for the course among the current crop of, quote, free speech defenders. Lindsay's hosts in Halifax, the so-called Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship are exemplary. The society, which was founded in 1992 with such noble goals as opposing hate speech legislation and affirmative action, and here's a parenthesis from me, I think they're actually employing sarcasm here, which suggests they have a sense of humor, but never mind that, has a documented history of anti-indigenous racism and its members have been involved in high-minded pursuits like screening the anti-feminist, quote, documentary, The Red Pill, and defending the, quote, right of Dal Dentistry students to make rape jokes about their female peers. All of which ought to make clear. The popularity of free speech discourse on the far right has nothing to do with free speech. What we actually see, upon scratching the surface, is that we actually have a case of right-wing politics and bigotry being popular with right-wing bigots. Now, another parenthesis, I actually enjoy the formal redundancy of that sentence, but the fact that they had to double down on the actuality of what they're saying makes it unconvincing. Resuming, the primary political objectives of these actors have little or nothing to do with defending those whose speech is met with state repression, but everything to do with advancing a political project which, when spoken about honestly as white supremacist, misogynistic, and sometimes openly fascist, is justly deemed below contempt. The attempt to center the act of speaking over the content of what is being said is a cheap trick to distract from the essence of discourse. If one speaks bullshit, they ought to be decried for their bullshit, and not celebrated for the banal act of speaking. Shepard and her literal neo-Nazi fans are reactionary bigots, not toddlers mumbling their first words. And I do find it interesting that that was very close to what Ifo said to Lindsay, that she's not too. 
Therefore, she should know that any decent person would agree with him. I learned very little today, next to nothing, but I had a blast. For some reason, when other people are getting worked up over their emotional commitments, I like to just sit back and observe the situation and try to understand it the best I can, and I find myself invigorated by doing so. There's something very satisfying and exciting about being buffeted from all sides by emotional winds and staying your course. I wish more people recognized that. I have a friend who will never stop suggesting that I should infiltrate these leftists. I have the costume, I have the history, I could pull it off. And it's hard to discount that possibility. I feel like I can't wait for spring to come and someone to try to tear down the Cornwallis statue again. Because when that happens, and it will happen, I'll be there with a big smile on my face and a willingness to talk rationally with anyone who wants the same. And I think that is our only option.